Hello, everyone. Welcome to our continuing study in the book of Ecclesiastes. Today, we are going to tackle 11 verses out of uh, chapter 10. Uh, they're going to be pretty provocative verses. There's a lot that happens in this book. It's a very dense book in terms of the wisdom and information contained in it. So um, it's uh, going to be a fun discussion this morning. We're going to cover, as we usually do, a lot of different territory. But before we go into the Word of God, Let's lay down a foundation of prayer. So please join me. Bow your hearts. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this day. We thank you, Father, for the fact that we know that you're in control of all of the details of this world, and we know that nothing escapes your attention, and nothing occurs that you haven't filtered either to permit it or cause it. And so, Father, as we think about that, we realize that everything is filtered through you, all of a sudden, we don't need to worry and be concerned about the things that are happening because we know that you have permitted them. And so you, we also know that you do nothing for our harm. You do everything for our own good. So sometimes it may be to teach us, and other times it may be that through the process we will learn something that will be important to us in our walk. So we thank you, Father, for loving us so much and making this a participative relationship. We just pray, Father, that you would give us a fresh infilling of your Holy Spirit, that we might understand what you have here for us and help us to apply that in our day-to-day -day walk. And we thank you for this time together and commit it to you in the precious name of your Son, Jesus Christ, our risen Lord and Savior. Amen. So as we begin to take a look at uh, today's session, I, I don't know about you, but it seems to me like life is a heavyweight battle between folly and wisdom. We think about these two, and so Solomon did an, an extraordinary job in the book of Proverbs presenting wisdom to us, and we spent many months in that book. Um, we, we looked at what folly is, but why is it? Why is it? And so a couple of thoughts. We're going to see this combination, wisdom and folly, appear 14 times in the chapter, in chapter 10. And that whenever you look at the density in terms of a frequency of a word or a phrase, and you see it appear in a concentrated area, it's the Holy Spirit who wrote this, who, who, who authored this using human writers. It's, it's his markings. And so we should probably pay attention to it, which is why the question. Wisdom and folly has been going on since before Lucifer, God's anointed cherub, became proud tried to become worshipped like God. And there's two passages, Ezekiel 28 and Isaiah 14, that bear our just refreshing. So Ezekiel 28, this is God speaking about Lucifer, a.k.a. Satan. You were, past tense, the anointed cherub who covers. Lucifer held a position in God's government as his chief worship leader. That's what that phrase means. Notice what it says next. God says, I established you. I created you, and I set you up in this position. You were on the holy mountain of God. So you were with me, God speaking, in heaven. You walk back and forth in the midst of fiery stones. And so that's one of the ways that God describes what heaven is like. You were, past tense, perfect in all your ways from the day you were created. You were created, and so as a created being complete, then you had wisdom. Lucifer had wisdom. Till, oh boy, that word, till iniquity was found in you. We'll look at that in just a minute. By the abundance of your training, you became filled with violence within, and you sinned. So notice that there is a progression here in Lucifer's background, how he became filled with violence back and forth, and this stuff was welling up inside him, and it corrupted him, and he sinned. Therefore, I cast you out as a profane thing from the mountain of God. Whenever you see mountain, it's usually synonymous with government. So I cast you out of the government of God. I destroyed you, O covering cherub, from the midst of the fiery uh, stones. And so we see that and we recognize that that is a challenge 
to perhaps some of our conventional thinking. But let's look at this other passage, a, a, a companion passage, Isaiah 14. It's easy to, to, to get these two. Isaiah 14, Ezekiel 28, all multiples of seven, right? Ooh, we'll make out of that of that what you would like. Remember, chapter headings are not inspired. So, But Isaiah 14, 12 says, How you were fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning. How you were cut down to the ground, you who weakened the nations. His By his sin, he caused the nations to become weak. He corrupted them. He made them sick. For you have said in your heart, ah, this is where sin begins. I will ascend into the heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit on the mount of the congregation on the farthest sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. Yet you shall be brought down to Sheol, that's the temporary abode of the dead, to the lowest depths of the pit, or the abuso, if you will. So when we see this and we begin to understand that this has been going on, wisdom versus folly has been going on for a long time. Remember, wisdom's from God, folly's from Satan, and the world system that Satan set up shortly after he was kicked out of heaven. So he's cast to earth, and in our study of understanding the last days coming up here and uh, beginning in, in mid-November, we'll take a look at a chapter that will chronicle the war that occurred in heaven where Satan was cast out along with many of his minions. And so he set up this fake government trying to be like God. You can see what he's, you know, I will be like, I will be this. Well, he set that up, his own version of it, set that up on planet Earth. And he's today still in charge of the world system. Folly requires little or no effort, while wisdom requires great and ongoing effort. The two contrasting the two doesn't take a whole lot of, of work for you to behave foolishly, but it does to behave in wisdom. It's work and it requires ongoing effort. It's not a once and done thing. See, the battleground of wisdom versus folly is in the human heart. That's ground zero for each person. Ground zero for them is what's going on in their heart. The stakes are everything. With that in mind, we have Ecclesiastes 10.1. We start out with a rather pleasant little verse. Dead flies putrefy the performer's ointment or the perfumer's ointment and cause it to give off a foul odor. So does a little folly to one who's respected for wisdom and honor. So we look at this and we, well, dead flies, and that's probably not a pleasant thought. Let's understand that dead flies, that term, meveth zebub, means literally death flies. Flies that bring death by contamination. That's exactly what it means. It's not just that they're physically dead, but they're bringing death because of their contamination. The word putrefy, ba'ash, means to cause a stink or a foul odor because of the contamination into a pristine substance like a perfumer's ointment, which is pristine because it's been, it's gone through lots of heat and boiling and boiling off all sorts of things to get it down to this, this very powerful essence. And so we get these two words and we see flies, we know them, they feed on garbage, they feed on feces, they feed on rotting things. They carry at least 65 known diseases in addition to what they just fed on. They feed on a dead body that's been out there roadkill by the side of the road for a week or so. That's nasty. It's nasty, and they, that's what they feed on. Well, the problem is this. They don't actually eat. They, they can only digest liquids, and so they, they eat, but then they regurgitate it in order to convert it to a digestible liquid. That's what they're doing on your food when they land on it. So, you know, that ought to give us a little pause about how we cover our food and leave food out and flies and we, ah, just a fly shoot away. No, <laughs> nasty stuff going on there. 
Now, the perfumer's ointment is very costly. It's an aromatic olive oil-based ointment. It's typically stored in an alabaster jar. Dead flies putrefying the perform perfumer's ointment is a very common idiom that Solomon would understand in that day. It's to express how a good thing is completely ruined by the introduction of something not good. We use the idiom today where there's a fly in the ointment. You may have heard that before. That's where this came from. Thus, when a person who's known and respected for his wisdom and honor acts in folly, they've essentially, this folly that's been introduced, that's when they hurt their reputation. They begin to stink things up because of what this is like. It's like that dead fly, if you will. Practically, it only takes one or two instances of folly to destroy a reputation that's built over years and years. Wise people learn to avoid folly like a contagious disease, just like the contagious diseases that flies carry. So we realize there's a lot more going on in this verse than just meets it. In the, we get the thought initially, but it's only when we look at it more deeply that we really get a full sense of what it is. Same with this next one. A wise man's heart it is at his right hand, but a fool's heart is at his left. Well, you and I look at that and we say, well, that's anatomically incorrect for a human being because in a human being's body, the heart is slightly to the left of center. There's an Orientalism here. Most cultures of the world in Solomon's day, the heart was considered the center of a person's being, the seat of their understanding. We see this thought every day. We say, well, this is the heart of the matter. Believe with all your heart or in your heart, you know this, you know, cross my heart. We, we always use that. And it's the central issue of the matter. Solomon told us in Proverbs that the heart, a person's heart, is their most important stewardship responsibility. He said in Proverbs 4.23, Keep or guard, military term, your heart with all diligence, for out of it spring the issues of life. Keep it with diligence. Guard it. Guard it. Be on guard. Now, the, you wouldn't have to be on guard with it if you didn't have an active enemy who's in charge of the world system and wants to knock you off of being a God follower, and he's hard at work trying to destroy this. Jeremiah explains man's great heart difficulty, which is rooted in the fact that he is born as a sinful creature. Jeremiah 17, 9 and 10, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? I, the Lord. That's a great question, a rhetorical question. Who can know it? Answer nobody except that the Lord answered this in Verse 10, I, the Lord, he's the only one that can know it because he searches the heart. He tests the mind even to give every man to according to his ways, according to the fruit of his doings. He understands the thoughts and the intents of our hearts. He's the only one that does that. In Isaiah 14, 13, we saw how Satan's rebellion began in his heart. Remember, it said, for you have said in your heart, I will. And we have those five I will statements. So the heart is where corruption begins. And that's why you and I have this very important stewardship responsibility. Now, Paul, the Apostle Paul, reminds us of the central role that our hearts have in salvation and justification. He says in Romans 10, 9 through 11, if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Very important passage that we probably learned early in our Christian learning. So in Eastern cultures, remember now it says a, man's, a wise man's heart is at his right hand, but a fool's heart is at his left. In Eastern cultures, handedness took on very special meaning. The right hand was the hand of honor and esteem and blessing and authority, so it was seen as the hand of strength. Things placed at the right hand were seen as good and correct. On the other hand, the left hand was seen as the hand of lesser honor. 
Also rejection, punishment, sometimes the hand of cursing. If someone cursed, that would be with their, they curse something, it would be with their left hand, not their right hand. Things placed at the left hand were considered as lesser, incorrect, or bad. So you have this handedness taking on a special point. But in scripture, we see the roles which the right hand and the left hand play. I'm going to give you three examples that are fairly prominent. Think about Jacob's last son, Benjamin. That means son of my right hand. That's what that name means. Benjamin, son of my right hand, son of my blessing, son of my authority. In heaven, Jesus was prophesied to sit at which hand of his father? Whenever we see him sitting in heaven, he's at the right hand of his father. There's a reason for that. In Matthew 25, 31 to 45, Jesus told of a future sheep and goats judgment where the right and the left equated to blessing or cursing. The sheep were blessed on my right hand, but the goats on my left hand, you see that we have this handedness. And so we should just pay attention to that handedness. The inclination of a person's heart to the right or to the left in Ecclesiastes 10.2 is a declaration of doing what's right or wrong in God's eyes. So there's a handedness. If, you're, if someone says your heart is inclined to the right, they're giving you a compliment and saying that you're inclined to do the things that are right before God. If they say you're Hearts inclined towards the left, not so. A wise person lives in the fear of God. They does what's right. That a fool living in his own wisdom does what's wrong. We know that from our study in Proverbs. Now, lest you take this too far, I would just caution you to maybe not apply it so strongly to today's political system, especially in the United States, right and left. I'll leave you with that one, but uh, I couldn't help throwing that barb in here. Now, it says here in verse 3, even a fool, or even when a fool walks along the way, he lacks wisdom and shows everyone that he's a fool. Well, this is pretty easy to understand. The picture is going to help us a little bit. The way a person walks through life re reveals him or her to be either a wise person or a fool. You know we're known by what we do as a wise person or a fool. Now, is this man dressed appropriately for walking along the, the way based on the prevailing conditions? Well, no, no one's going to walk in, a, in hardly any clothing, something for the summer in the middle of winter when there's snow on the ground. No, but a fool would do that. A fool would do that. The, the, the foolish choice shows the absence of wisdom. He's only to blame for being cold. If he gets frostbite, if he gets hypothermia, that's something he brought upon himself. He, God didn't cause that. God may permit it to learn a lesson. A fool never listens to wisdom and reason, likely won't learn from anything that he fails. So blinded to his own failings by pride and arrogance, the heart of a fool gravitates towards the left. That's why it. The, we talked about the, the, the fool's Foolish person's heart is at their left hand. It's that they may be individual proverbs that Solomon's stating here, but they're connected, and we see that here. So, having laid down a foundational principle in these first three biz verses, the rest of the chapter, all twenty verses, Solomon is going to apply wisdom to four different kinds of fools. We're going to look at two of them today. Ecclesiastes 10, 4 to 7, this next tranche of, of uh, verses, if the spirit of the ruler, the one in charge, rises against you, do not leave your post, for conciliation pacifies great offenses. There is an evil I've seen under the sun. Remember, whenever we look at under the sun, that's without God. There's an evil that I've seen under the sun as an error proceeding from the ruler. Folly is set in great dignity while the rich sit in a lowly place. I've seen servants on horses while princes work on the, walk on the ground like servants. So the first type of fool that Solomon is going to describe here in verses 4 to 7 is a foolish ruler. The word ruler, mashal, means governor one who has power or dominion over someone or something. 
It could apply to a civic leader, a business leader, a ministry leader, or a political leader. It could apply to any one of those leaders as a Michal, but the adjective foolish describes where their heart is as they lead. And Solomon's saying that a danger, first on the list here, is somebody who's in charge who's foolish. Again, I'm not going to make a political commentary here. I'll leave you to do that for yourself. So let's look at this in detail. If the spirit of a ruler rises against you, do not leave your post, for conciliation pacifies great offenses. So what kind of fool is the leader described here in verse 4? What does this particular ruler do? Well, if there was one role that is very dangerous, it's the fool is more dangerous to others is when he or she is in a leadership role because they get to direct people's activities and people are supposed to follow the leader. So when the leader is a fool and people do what they're supposed to do and follow the leader, then the leader leads them into foolishness. Not a good situation. Solomon in his early days as king following the death of his father. Remember, when David passed away, he was still a relatively young lad, and he asked God for wisdom. That's when God said, tell me what you want. You're now the king. Tell me what you want. And Solomon prayed for wisdom. This is what he said in first in Kings 3, 9. Therefore, give to your servant. This is Solomon speaking to God. Give to your servant an understanding heart to judge your people, that I may discern between good and evil. For who is able to judge this great people of yours? He looked for wisdom and understanding so that he could be an effective leader. He understood that that's what a leader needed to have, wisdom. So this phrase, if the, the spirit of the ruler rises against you, is Solomon's way of describing a ruler that is driven by pride. This the spirit, their spirit of pride rises against you, means it's an act of pride. And so what happens is he's not following wisdom, he's allowing himself to be led by his own foolish desires, this leader, he gets angry and he typically takes it out on the people around him, who probably didn't have anything to do with why he's angry, but this is what a foolish leader does. And likely the servants are the closest at hand, and so he might abuse them. And that's what Solomon's talking about, because he sees that. Solomon looked at governments all over the world and saw this as a common folly of fools when a ruler is foolish. So the leader has no self-awareness, no self-control. He's very low in empathy, and that points to why he's unable to lead effectively. You show me a, a person in a position of authority that has no control over his anger and his pride or her anger and her pride, I'm going to show you someone that will be a disaster as a leader. And we Again, we see that in our own sphere of influence. We maybe at work or maybe in, in school or maybe in our political system. Proverbs 16.32 said, he who is slow to anger is better than the mighty, and he who rules his spirit implied is better than he who takes a city. Same thought. Whoever has no rule over his own spirit is like a city broken down without walls. That's Proverbs 25, 28. So this issue of self-control for a ruler is something that Solomon has spoken about often. And Solomon is now speaking to those people that find themselves in the unfortunate position of working for a bad boss who is foolish. And, they're, and, and he's saying to them, exercise self-control for yourself. Stay where you are. Don't leave your post because that's going to be, you're going to get nailed for desertion. Instead, stay where you are, but seek to bring that leader who's foolish, seek to pacify him, seek to bring him peace. We find this in, in, in the book of Proverbs. And Proverbs 25, 15 says, by long forbearance, bearing with, a ruler is persuaded. Long-suffering. Who else is long-suffering as our example? You see, a gentle tongue breaks a bone. 
you may think that it's might, but you get people to make a change when you're, you respond to their anger softly. A soft answer turns away wrath, it says. Proverbs 16, 14 is messengers of death as the king's wrath, but a wise man will appease it. In other words, if you find yourself in that situation serving a boss who is impassioned foolishly, your best strategy is to pacify that individual and try to get their, them to calm down, not say it because that never works, is they calm down to somebody, they're just going to get more angry. So again, this calls for wisdom. But as you bring that person's anger level down, they're going to begin to think more clearly. And now you stand a much better chance. So we have this, if the spirit of the ruler rises against you, do not leave your post. We figured that out so far. For conciliation pacifies great offenses. Conciliation is the word in Hebrew, marpe, which means literally a medicine or curative that heals or remedies. In other words, in this case, healing or remedying the agitated condition of the ruler. And so those who are surrounding the king, they know his short temper or her short temper, and they seek to soothe or pacify them. That's the strategy that they go to. Now you can think back and remember when Saul was seized with anger against David, what did David do? He played music, and it helped to soothe Saul. You see how these things are all connected, these concepts are so powerful. So what if the, the king or leader is righteously indignant? Okay, some, we talked about fully. What if they're righteously indignant and therefore gets angry? Is that okay? Many of us look and say, well, I'm angry because I'm angry at the things that God's angry at. Okay, is that okay? Well, three times in Proverbs, Solomon states the benefit of a multitude of counselors. And I've given you the verses here. They're in your notes. You can look at this uh, recording along with the slides. will be posted in a couple of days so you can get these. This is designed, the multitude of counselors are designed to help you navigate the situation when times get difficult, when you're not thinking clearly. That's why a multitude of counselors is a benefit, people there. So in verse 4, the ruler had a multitude of counselors who were empowered by the ruler to advise him when he is wrong in a matter. That's a good, that's a wise ruler. You know, I, I, you tell me when I'm wrong. See, that's, a, that's the mark of an effective leader because they're seeking that and realize that they're human just like everybody else. And if they get angry or they're not seeing something correctly and they're about to make a mistake, it's a blessing to them to have people that have the courage to speak up. Righteous anger, though, occurs strictly in accordance with God's holy response when there's an outbreak of sin. So when expressed by a human, it has to be rightly expressed, if it's to be expressed at all. So that righteous anger, and you look at this, and maybe the ruler is angry about something, that, uh, the, the way that the people are carrying out a good policy, but they've perverted it somehow and made it a bad and sinful policy, and that might be the ruler expressing frustration. Rulers, kings, leaders, you and I also can get an idea in our heads that we believe that we're correct in expressing righteous indignation. The challenge, though, for us is that we can become overzealous. And when we now become beyond righteous indignation and we start raging on, that's when we've lost control. We need that self-control and self-awareness. Overzealous expression of anger can be rooted in pride. In other words, you think we think we're right here, and that's when we have to enlist godly counselors to help sometimes talk us down off the ledge so that we can examine our own motives, get ourselves all worked up. It doesn't do anybody any good, especially those that have to suffer under that when you're suffering under a foolish leader. There's an evil that I've seen under the sun, continues Solomon in verse 5, as an error proceeding from the ruler. Folly is set in great dignity the, while the rich sit in a lowly place. I've seen servants on horses while princes walk on the ground like servants. Well, what's all that about? 
Well, the word dignity, marom, means an elevated place or position. It's high, lofty, it's above. Lowly, it's opposite. Shafel means a lowly place or position, typically a menial role that a servant would have. And typically a servant is going to walk after the master who's on horseback, not the other way around. Well, there's more to this than just that mental picture. A common way that leaders act foolishly is to select people that are ineffective that serve in that leader's administration as a junior official. Now, it's interesting to look at this aspect of junior officials that serve because the leader has appointed that person to this position. Fools always think themselves the smartest of people. So typically they'll look at a very competent person and be not comfortable with that person because they're competent and they know they themselves are not competent because that person will look like they're more competent than they are. So they'll typically not put them in that next level of command underneath. They may be okay in the much lower levels out there where there's no personal threat. But if this person who's a junior to me is a heck of a lot more competent than I am, everybody's going to see that, right? And everybody's going to realize, okay, well, this leader isn't all that hot, but this number two is, maybe this number two ought to be the leader. Competent people are typically by a, an incompetent or foolish leader are placed at the lowest levels. There's no, no threat at that point. See, to illustrate how a leader should never be a fool, this is why Solomon is using this Orientalism and a role reversal of the day. This role reversal that he's using is the master is walking behind the servant who now is riding on the horseback. And that that's ride, if the master is assuming that lowly that lowly position, that is the way things should not be. And that, that's one of those situations where Solomon's saying, look, this is foolish because it's, it's exactly the opposite of what it's going to be. Now, we know we can immediately think of Jesus washing his, his disciples' feet. He was doing that to illustrate a real key point that a leader is not better than his followers. So what's the purpose that the leader has for doing this? Is a leader doing this because he wants to show everybody, hey, look at me, I'm a really compassionate person and I'm going to walk and let my, what's the motive? You see, you and I can't see that because we can't see the heart. God does. Rulers and people in authority should never be fools. However, you dice that and slice that because when they're fools, the results are not good. Solomon's son would make this mistake. Solomon's son would make this exact mistake. After Solomon died and his son rose to power, he got rid of all of dad's advisors and he got a bunch of his buddies, his drinking buddies, and put them all into positions. And they told him to do something really stupid. And he did it. And it cost the United Kingdom, which fractured as a result of following bad guidance from incompetent advisors. Leaders, choose your advisors wisely. Let's take a look at this next tranche of verses. He who digs a pit will fall into it, and whoever breaks through a, a wall will be bitten by a servant. servant. He who quarries stones may be hurt by them, and he who splits wood may be endangered by it. If the axe is dull and one does not sharpen the edge, then he must use more strength. But wisdom brings success. A serpent may bite when it's not charmed. The babbler's no different. So fool number two, we can just get from this set of verses, is the foolish worker who works unsafely, carelessly, perhaps with just stupidity, while going about executing his or her duties. So in verses eight and nine, how does this person become a fool? Well, work that exposes the worker to risk or danger requires the worker to first, before anything else, prepare both physically and mentally. If you're going to go out and pick up dangerous equipment, you better know how to use that equipment, but you also better take a look at your surroundings before you just start wailing away. Most of us will get that. 
you know, you, you, we have to do things that are safe, that are not going to cause a danger to ourselves and others. So in Israel, remember that every boy learned a trade from his father. Even those who would become priests and Levites also taught their children a trade. Just because if they didn't become a priest or a prophet, that they would have a trade to fall back on. We looked at uh, last time or the time before that a father who doesn't teach his child a trade is raising a thief, training his child to be a thief, because without a trade, you have no ability to support yourself. So boys learned the trade, but girls learned household management from mom, as well as select trades, if you remember our discussion of Proverbs 31. There she learned uh, cloth making, there she learned grape husbandry, raising up uh, a vineyard. She learned a lot of trades. And so there, this, this idea of being able to support yourself is just bound up in the essence of what's important. So when we look at work, most work that we do is in pursuit of our jobs or the work that we have to take care of the things that God has given us to care for. Each, the boy and the girl, would apprentice for more than a decade under the parent. You realize that. We think about apprenticing, and if you're a, you know, a plumber and you have a young apprentice to learn to become a master plumber, there's years of, of work involved. Well, it's the same thing here. So the, the, the child would apprentice on, under the parent, and so they learn both the basics of the job as well as the nuances of the job. And it's those nuances that Solomon's talking about here when he says, he who digs a pit will fall into it, again, if they're foolish. Whoever breaks through a wall will be bitten by a serpent, if that person's foolish. He who quarries stones may be hurt by them, if he's foolish. And he who splits wood may be endangered by it, if he's stupid, or if he's foolish, probably also stupid. But each, each, each. Each person needs to learn both the physical and mental preparation for the job to be done. So Solomon lists these four examples that I just shared with you. Unsafe work habits. Self-endangerment is exemplified by falling into a pit one's digging. You're digging and digging and all of a sudden it's slip, boom, right there. Now you're in the pit that you dug. And if you're doing this by yourself, guess who's there to help you out? Nobody. So Watch what you're doing. Next here is not checking the area thoroughly before taking action. So if you break through a wall, you've got a hole in a wall, and you just simply reach your hand blindly through. Do you know what's on the other side of that wall? Maybe there's snakes. Maybe there's some kind of vermin in there that's going to bite you. So you need to just stop and think, stop and think. And that's what Solomon's saying. See, fools think they're the smartest person. They don't think. They just act. And then they wind up, I wonder why I got hurt. Third one here is foolish injuries by trying to do something you shouldn't do. So if you're quarrying stones, you could be hurt with them. Look, if you're picking up something and you just lean over and pick up this thing that's really too heavy for you, you're probably going to hurt your back. You're probably going to hurt yourself. Then when you drop the thing, you're going to drop it on your foot. You're going to break your foot. So again, this is talking about foolish workers, workers who don't stop and think. And this last one here. Um, splitting wood and be endangered by it, not paying close attention to the job. So you're working, but you're daydreaming and you swing your ax down and there's no piece of wood there, but your shin's right there. We, we just, we, this foolish worker and Solomon, remember, went all over his country looking for examples. He contemplated, he saw this stuff. Well, let's, let's tear this apart a little bit. Verse 10 says, if the axe is dull and one doesn't sharpen the edge, then he must use more strength. But in contrast to using more strength, wisdom brings success. Wisdom is better than brute force. And so we think about, about this. There's a difficult way and a wise way to accomplish things. The difficult way to accomplish things, if you're chopping wood, is to why don't you just get another log and beat the log against the wood that you want? Eventually, something's going to break. It's not, not the smart way to do it. Use a sharp axe. 
But this means you've got to think things through ahead of time. You have to spot potential problems ahead of time. Think about contingency plan. What happens if this does? What am I going to do? All of those things should be done when we're trying to do the work that we do. You've all heard the expression, measure once, cut twice, or cut twice, measure once. Measure twice, cut once. We have to recognize that we need to think things through before we simply do them. Consider the example of chopping wood with an ax. The ax has to be sharpened first. That's a wise choice. Although you could chop with a dull blade. I'm sure all of us have done that. But it's much harder work. It goes slower. That's the difficult choice. Wise choice, difficult choice. But there's more to this example than just this sharpening of the axe. If you sharpen the axe, that's usually done on a grinding wheel. Well, if you're going out in the woods to chop wood, are you bringing your grinding wheel with you? No, you're stopping and thinking about this beforehand. You're back in the shop and you're grinding. You need to do this before you left for the woods. So again, thinking things through, we just we're in such a hurry sometimes in our in our world today that we just don't stop and think before we do and that's why things become unraveled quickly because if we just stop and thought about it for a minute we might plan a much better way see if the laborer sharpened the blade well then if you put a coating of oil on the blade before and between uses that's going to help keep the edge it's going to also keep it sharper longer so you don't have to go back into the shop and grind it. Reminds me of a good friend of mine who is a very, um, very experienced professional, decided to, to uh, retire at age 67. And Joe's a good guy. He just he's fascinated by tools. And so he got a job at Home Depot. And he happened to be working in the outdoor section, and he told me about this customer that came in and said, um, I've never had power equipment before. Um, everybody tells me I ought to get a chainsaw. It's that time of year, a lot of firewood. I'm just tired of trying to split this stuff the old-fashioned way. So he goes ahead and says, sell me the best chainsaw you got. All right. So Joe says, you know how to use this? Yeah, yeah I'll figure it out. Okay, great. So here's the chainsaw that he bought. And he came back about, oh, three, four days later, and he was not happy. He says, this stinking thing doesn't work. I, it, it's not, it's taken me more time to use the chainsaw than splitting by, by an ax and using a regular saw. This thing's broken. You need to replace it. Joe's a good guy. It's policy of the store. Customer's always right, replaces the chainsaw, and he leaves and comes back in about two hours, and his face is brick red. And he throws the thing down. He says, This thing doesn't work. And just said, Okay, okay, look, let's just went out to the side area and out out from the, the store and went ahead and started it up. And the customer goes, What's that sound? You see. Sometimes we assume that we know what we're doing before we do it. Didn't realize how the thing worked. So at the end of the day, we have to think things through. Fools don't think ahead. They simply respond in a moment. They think they know everything. Wise people plan well ahead. They anticipate ahead. They take steps to optimize all the situations. That's what wise people do. All right, let's talk about verse 11. A serpent may bite when it is not charmed, and the babbler is no different. Now, most of us think about serpents and biting, and we think about snakes, and some of us kind of think they're cool, and some of us like, get them away from me. So what does this have to do with foolish workers? Remember, we're talking in Solomon's day. This is 3,000 years ago. It was a common form of entertainment in the East to observe a snake charmer at work. That was just very common. So you went and heard the snake charmer. You'd hear them, the little flute thing that they're playing. Snakes that they used were poisonous ones, typically like the cobra. And this made very dangerous work for the snake charmer. The fact is that snakes 
hear the charmer's music through the bones in their head. And it's a combination of playing music in a particular rhythm with the charmer's swaying motion as he's playing this and hold, looks at the snake because when you look at a snake and you hold its gaze and then it starts doing this along with the charmer. And now all of a sudden, the beast that could be very dangerous is much easier to handle. See, the charmer does this for money. And more shows that he puts on, the more money he makes. So he collects a group of people, a little sound there. And the more he can do, the more shows he can put on, the more money he's going to make. So cr crowds will gather pretty quickly. You can go still see this in parts of the world in the in the uh, east. And you'll you'll hear these things, especially when it's a holiday, when crowds are coming in and people are like, OK, they're coming to visit this city and what are we going to do for entertainment? So you kind of get the, the picture. In verse 11, here it says, a serpent may bite when it's not charmed. Well, you haven't charmed it first. So if you go grab it, it's not going to like that. It's probably going to bite you. That would be foolish. Most snake charmers that actually live um, learn this lesson pretty quickly. Here, it, you think about, the well, short. let's take a shortcut. I, I don't have to do this. Maybe I had four shows and the thing's charmed. Because it was charmed three shows, I don't have to do it this fourth time. Not a risk you want to take. Maybe, and you think about the shortcuts that people take, and that's what Solomon is talking about here. Shortcuts. Why shortcuts are not good. Either way... The snake charmer is a foolish worker whose foolishness could cost him his own life or make him quite sick or possibly if the snake is agitated, someone in the crowd is going to get bitten and that's going to be really problematic. But it's interesting that Solomon, I imagine he does this tongue in cheek, handling a babbler is not unlike handling an uncharmed poisonous snake. You see the word babbler, Baal. Lashon means literally a master of the tongue who is a speaker of evil, who uses words skillfully with malice for the intent of inflicting pain. You know, back in the day, you would think of someone that is a professional heckler would do this. Sometimes at sporting events, you'll hear people like this that are Baal Lashon, they're babblers. The fact is the term babbler is almost always used derogatorily, derogatorily, because someone who's a babbler is also a fool. They don't realize the pain that their words inflict. They speak and they speak out of anger and they speak without thinking and they don't really care whether or not their words hurt other people. So that's the type of person that you're, you're talking about. A serpent may bite when it's not charmed. A babbler is no different. If you're going to handle, if you're going to traffic with a babbler, you have someone that has the potential to do you and others harm. And you don't want that. So the admonishment here is to not handle ever someone who's known to sting with their words, which is just as dangerous unless you're prepared. Unless you've really thought through how you're going to deal with this person that's the heckler. You know, back in the day before our current stadiums were built, Vet Stadium was notorious for the fights. It was one of the few sporting venues in the United States that had a judge sitting right there in court, ready to rule over the events that happened in Vet Stadium. And you realize that there was a lot of stuff that went on there that was bad. Why? Because people had too much drink. And so someone would say something and somebody else doesn't like it. And pretty soon fisticuffs break out. Handling somebody who is a babbler. Do it with care. Don't incite a fight with that person. It's going to be a big fight. And everybody's going to get injured. And then Judge Seamus, whatever his name was, would go ahead and rule on this and people were thrown into jail. It was that simple. It was all done right on premises because of the bad reputation that that place had. Bottom line, 
each of us, you and I, have a choice of approaching all the life situations. We can approach it with wisdom. We can approach it with foolishness. It's our choice. We command that choice. You know, there's a lot of things in life that we don't control, that we find as circumstances that simply happen. But this is one. Choices about how we prepare. And in this set of verses, we're talking about doing the work that we do. Many of the things that we do have tools that can harm or processes that if not done correctly can cause a major problem. If we go in and we fool around with source coding on a computer, we're going to crash a program and might not ever get it back, might lose data. So there's a lot of things that we have to look at the way we prepare for a job. See, God's people, God's people should always strive to be wise leaders when placed into a position to lead. We should be wise workers when we're placed into a situation to work. God's given us those opportunities. He's equipped us with the skill. He's equipped us with the brain. He's equipped us with the opportunities. All of that's come from God. But you and I are the ones charged with executing it. And we should exercise proper wisdom. The choice you and I make to be wise or foolish, by the way, is our witness to the world because the whole world watches us to see what we will do. Let's conclude in prayer. Please join me. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time in your word. We thank you for the truth that you have given us here in this these passages. And although they're quick to read and seemingly easy to understand, Father, every time we look at your word, as we should always do, we see it speak truth to us on multiple levels. How marvelous is your word, O oh Lord. How marvelous is your word. And we thank you for giving us this opportunity to gather together. Thank you for the country in which we live that allows us to participate together in worship and study of your word, to see these things that we might learn them, we might apply them, that we might walk differently. We thank you for these things and just ask your blessing and continued leading in wisdom in the precious and powerful name of your son, our risen Lord and Savior, and God's people said, amen and amen.